All right, well, welcome one and all to our MHU lunch chat. Um, we are really excited today to have two of my colleagues from the um, Michigan State University College of uh, Veterinary Medicine. Um, Dr. Jane Manfredi uh, is here, as well as uh, Dr. Julie Stracata. And uh, they will be uh, talking to you today on uh, vaccinations and biosecurity during your horse's spring checkup. So we will get started. If you have questions, uh, feel free to use your uh, Q&A uh, at the bottom of your screen. And uh, we will try to get those answered uh, in real time or hold them until the very end of our presentation. And then uh, if you are with us through Facebook Live, uh, welcome. Uh, feel free to uh, post your questions right into the comment uh, section below the video stream. Uh, so with that, we will get started. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, uh, my name is Dr. Stracota and I will start off this presentation today and talk to you about what a vaccine is. Um, and so a vaccine is a dose of bacteria or virus that's inactivated or modified to try and avoid causing disease. There are two or more doses needed to get an adequate immune response. And so typically we will booster vaccines yearly. Um, and there are two different ways that we can give vaccines to our equine patients. First and the most common would certainly be intramuscular or IM. And then sometimes we do have some vaccines that are intranasal vaccines. And so those are the two routes where we will vaccinate our horse patients. Um, and so to follow up on that is I just wanted to share with you the common injection locations for intramuscular injections. And so there are four common places. So the most common I would say overall is that we use those neck muscles. Secondly, we can use the pectoral or chest muscles. Third, we can use the hamstring, or we call it the semimembranosus, semitendinosus muscles. And then lastly, you will see people that give injections in the gluteal muscles. Um, we tend to stick away from the gluteal muscles. There can be some um, complications associated with injections, and so um, we do tend to not recommend using them, but um, you will see that out in practice. So why do we want to vaccinate our horses? So um, we are trying to get a protective barrier against a variety of diseases. And so I listed these here um, and we will talk about them today, but tetanus, West Nile, rhinopneumonitis, strangles, encephalomyelitis, influenza, rabies, Potomac horse fever, just some of the vaccines that we have available for our horses. Um, I have rabies in red. So that is the one disease that is zoonotic. And what I mean by zoonotic is that a horse, if it were to get rabies, could give you as a human rabies. And so that's what zoonotic means, the risk to the human population. It's also part of responsible horsemanship and also an integral part of biosecurity. So this is Dr. Manfredi, and I'm going to take over for a little bit of a minute to talk about the next few slides about biosecurity. Um, and so biosecurity is obviously a topic that has been brought more to the attention lately, um, but we're going to talk about it in a global sense. And so um, biosecurity, when it comes to these vaccines and vaccination practices, are a way to limit the risk of disease um, to your horses from other horses um, and to prevent that spread of disease from going to other locations too. And so biosecurity has been an um, a important management program um, as part of your wellness in your horses for um, many, many years now. And so it's important to look at it from horse to horse as well as horse to human or as we now are concerned about human to human as well. Um, so these yearly vaccinations are very important to preventing disease transmission um, but now, obviously, we have an additional concern that we want to just kind of talk briefly about. So, Julie, if you could pass it on to the next slide, please. 
So um, our governor has um, ordered several executive orders um, regarding uh, the COVID-19 situation. Um, and so the one thing we want to call your attention to is that um, at least still until May 15th right now, there is a non-essential veterinary service clause. Um, that means that um, veterinary services that are provided either at the vet school or by your own DVMs are those that are needed to preserve the life of the animal um, as determined by your veterinarian, um, needed for treating serious pain or, or health that threatens the safety of the animal as determined by your veterinarian, um, if you need to euthanize an animal or if you need to have the vet see the animal to treat or prevent transmission of infectious disease. And that's where our yearly vaccines come in. Um, because a lot of those are geared towards preventing infectious disease spread between horses to horses. Um, and so for sure, all of your horses can be seen by a veterinarian um, to receive these important vaccinations to prevent that from being a problem. Okay, if you can go to the next slide, please. And so the thing that's different is that we also now to, need to think a little bit about biosecurity um, and human to human possible transmission of disease um, with COVID-19. And so some of the biosecurity features that veterinarians might ask of their clients um, to help prevent spread from veterinarian to client um, or client to other individuals um, would be at farm calls. Um, the veterinarian might be wearing a mask and might ask for you to be wearing a mask. Um, if you don't have one, if you can let your veterinarian know and they could potentially bring one for you if they have that. Um, we are trying to still maintain that social distance of six feet apart or more. Again, talk to your veterinarian about their um, degree of comfort with that. Um, a lot of the veterinarians that are in ambulatory practice are having a technician come with them and actually trying to interact most closely with, with that technician. And so um, your, the technician might be the one to handle the horse um, more than you on these farm calls. And again, a way to kind of minimize the transmission potentially from human to human. Um, if you do have an appointment, a lot of veterinarians are asking that there's only one person at the appointment, um, if possible, and that you already have your horse caught up on either um, stop, uh, cross ties or in the stall, um, so that, that it makes it easier for the veterinarian to access your animal quickly and easily. Um, we also uh, just want everyone to know that there is definitely extra sanitation time and steps that we have to take um, before and after calls to make sure that we're keeping you and your horses safe. And so kind of recognizing that um, is an important part of something that we'd like to share to make a client veterinarian um, interactions as positive as possible. The biggest thing is communication as always. So before you have an appointment, talk to your veterinarians about what um, they're requiring and what they're doing to keep you and themselves safe. Um, and then an additional thing is to be prepared if you have the opportunity to send pictures or videos of what's going on with your horse in advance to help the veterinarian outline, is this um, an essential service that needs to be performed right now for the health and safety of the animal? And then they can also start to make a better plan about what they need to bring to the call um, to help both the animal as well as to keep everybody involved safe. Um, and so with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Dr. Shakota to talk a little bit about um, briefly what MSU is requiring as far as biosecurity at the current time. Perfect. So here at Michigan State, we are um, really an only emergency clinic currently. So we're not seeing non-essential um, animals, but anything deemed an emergency um, by referring vet or by yourself, um, we will see. And the first thing that will happen is there's a series of questions that you'll be asked on the phone. So if you call ahead and, and give us a heads up that you are bringing in your horse, um, you will be asked these questions. And so um, these questions are to protect um, our technicians and our staff, um, as well as to um, try and protect you. And so um, once we ask you these questions, um, we will then determine what will happen once you arrive at the clinic. So regardless of, we give you, a, it's what's called as a green, yellow, or red. Um, and so if you, um, regardless of what color you're designated, um, at this time, um, no clients are allowed in the clinic. And so you will unload your animal and a technician or veterinarian will be there to take your animal. Um, depending on the risk of that animal transmitting something to our staff, you may see our um, 
whoever greets you at the door having a variety of different personal protection um, on, whether that be some sort of a mask, um, a plastic hood, something like that. But regardless of how you answer those questions, at this point, um, you will not be allowed in the clinic. Uh, the one caveat is if humane euthanasia needs to occur, and if that is the case, um, one to two people are allowed in with that animal once the animal is prepared for euthanasia. So um, that is the one time where um, we are allowing people to, to see their animal. Um, when you arrive at the clinic, what they'll ask is for you to first call um, on the phone and someone will um, come out to greet you. So that at no point in time will you be entering the facility. Um, if you have to use the bathroom, there's a porta potty outside, but um, just know that that's for right now. When you come to pick your animal up, they will also bring the animal out to you. Um, so let me go back on here. And so let's talk a little more about vaccines. And so um, what vaccines does your horse need to have? And so um, not every horse requires every vaccine. And so um, depending on exposure risk, geographic location, maybe age or use, and certainly pregnancy status will all change what you and your veterinarian will decide is the appropriate vaccine schedule for your horse. Um, there's always consequences of disease. So like I mentioned already, zoonotic potential. For us, rabies is the highest um, and only zoonotic disease that we have in the horse. Another question that you and your veterinarian can de determine is, is the risk of morbidity or mortality. So what's the likelihood that my horse may get this disease? And what is the likelihood that my horse may die from this disease? And so those are all criteria to think about whether um, you choose to vaccinate your animal or not. Um, certainly there's potential for adverse reactions. There are some animals that um, have had serious enough adverse reactions that we may recommend not vaccinating that animal, meaning that the morbidity or the chance of that animal getting the disease is not as high as the risk for that animal dying from the vaccine, having some sort of anaphylactic response. And then certainly the cost of the vaccine versus the cost to treat that animal if it were to get sick. As far as adverse reactions go, um, most commonly we see mild side effects, so like a low-grade fever, lethargy, he or she may not want to eat, um, and having some tenderness or stiffness at the injection site. So more of these more severe or concerning um, side effects would be colic, difficulty breathing, um, the development of hives. Um, and those animals we may either pre-treat with banamine the next year, we may eventually actually decide that we shouldn't either switch up what type of vaccine we're giving, um, or maybe potentially not give a vaccine to that horse anymore. Julie, we've got a, a question. Um, are newborn foals vaccinated? Okay, yeah, that's a good question. So with the mare's placentation, um, she is such that when that foal was born, he or she does not have any immunity. And so it's really important that that foal nurses in order to get what we call colostrum. And so what happens is 30 days prior to that mare's due date, she should be vaccinated with what we're gonna discuss here in a second, which is the core vaccines. She should be vaccinated so that we can get adequate immunity within that mare to then transfer it via colostrum. And so in the first 24 hours of life, that neonate will absorb the immunity through its GI tract and then start to develop antibodies to these um, diseases. And so it is really important in our equine species that they do get colostrum. Um, as far as when we start to vaccinate, um, we'll talk about that, but usually it's around four to six months of age will we actually start to vaccinate that foal. Great, so thank you. Yeah. So as far as core vaccines, we will discuss tetanus, eastern western encephalitis, West Nile, and rabies. And so regardless of where you're at in the United States, these are what our AAP, American Association for Equine Practitioners, considers the core vaccines. So whether you're in California, Florida, or here in Michigan, 
every horse is recommended to be vaccinated for these. And so just we'll briefly talk about each, um, each of these diseases. Um, so first, tetanus. Um, also, we think of it as lockjaw. And so this is a bacteria that is ubiquitous within our environment. So it's found in the GI tract and also in soil, and it exists for years in soil. So um, what we are concerned about this is if a horse were to get a puncture wound, a laceration, or in those neonates, the umbilicus or the belly button of those neonates, we can, are concerned about risk of tetanus in these animals. And so some of the symptoms that we'll see is these animals will get this sawhorse stance, which is what the picture on the right depicts. They'll have tremors, they'll have muscle rigidity, often are hypersensitive to noise, light and touch, and they actually can have their third eyelid prolapse, so you won't be able to see the globe of their eye like you normally would. As you can see, a pretty high mortality, greater than 80% of horses that contract tetanus will die from it. Um, and so it's a very um, important vaccine to give to your animals. So we do that as an annual immunization with certainly a booster after puncture wounds if that animal has not been vaccinated for tetanus within the past six months. So um, let's say you haven't given your vaccine yet for this year and your horse were to get a wound today, um, your vet would more than likely ask and um, suggest that you booster that animal for at least tetanus today to make sure that it's covered um, and prevent this disease. So the next um, group of disease that we talk about are the encephalitis. And so this is known as sleeping sickness, um, which is Eastern encephalitis, Western encephalitis, and Venezuelan encephalitis. Um, Last year, um, we did have an increase in the number of Eastern encephalitis cases here in Michigan. So um, we will talk and I'll give you the number of cases that we did have reported, but we do see this, it is in our environment. It is a mosquito vector. So mosquito bite is how the horse will get it. Some of the clinical signs are fever, depression, anorexia, and progressively the, the horse will become neurologic. And so in this picture, this is a horse that's recumbent and there's a sling around this horse. And so every so often we can lift that horse up to try and prevent bed sores and try and get it using its feet some. Um, once they progress to that um, point, a lot of them do not um, recover. So pretty high mortality, greater than 75%. And of those three, Eastern, Western, and Venezuelan encephalitis, the Eastern encephalitis is the most virulent or causes the most disease. So this is an annual vaccine. Um, and like I said, um, last year here in Michigan, we actually had saw an increase in the number of human cases as well as horse cases. And so there were 29 um, reported cases in equine. Um, and the majority of those were unvaccinated or not vaccinated by um, a licensed veterinarian. Another mosquito um, transmitted disease is West Nile. Um, this will cause very similar clinical signs in your horses, Eastern encephalitis or Western encephalitis will. So we'll see fever, depression, anorexia, muscle tremors. Eventually they'll become ataxic and recumbent. A little bit less mortality um, with about 35% of these animals um, being humanely euthanized or passing away. This is an annual to biannual vaccine depending on the risk in your area. So that's something that you and your veterinarian can discuss and decide if you're going to give this vaccine every six months or once a year. I put up two different um, years for the reported number of West Nile cases here in Michigan. So in 2017, we actually saw an increased number similar to what we saw in Eastern encephalitis last year. So we saw 15 cases in West, of West Nile in 2017, all unvaccinated in the past five years. And last year we saw one um, in 2019, so, um, and that one was unvaccinated. Um, so this year um, I don't have, there have been no cases, we haven't had mosquitoes yet, um, and so um, I'm reporting last year's numbers. 
So um, I think it's important to note, so both of these are mosquito vectors or transmitters um, after acquiring the disease from an infected host. And so humans and horses are dead end hosts, um, but controlling this disease in the equine population is important to decrease the prevalence of the disease in our overall community. So um, with our current stay at home order, it still is important to be to vaccinating your horses, having your veterinarian not to do this to try and decrease the disease overall in our communities. So lastly of our core vaccines is rabies. Like I said, this is a, the one zoonotic disease. It is transmitted by the bite of a rabid animal. So either that being a raccoon, a fox, a skunk, or a bat, that is how your animal um, will get it. The virus does migrate into the brain and will eventually lead to neuroscience. And so at first you may see fever, depression, blindness, trouble swallowing, um, hypersensitivity to noise or light. You may be excitable. To be honest with you, a horse that has rabies can look like almost anything. And that's the one thing that why I, I always stress having your horse vaccinated and being able to prove that your horse was vaccinated by a veterinarian is an important thing for this disease. Mortality is 100%. Um, and this is an annual vaccine. So now we talked about the core vaccines and now I, um, we can discuss for a few minutes the risk-based vaccines. And so these are um, diseases that, um, depending on what your horse does, if your horse is, let's say, at a boarding facility versus if your horse lives out in your backyard and never travels anywhere, has no exposure to any other equids, you may actually not want to vaccinate for these animals or may have a very low risk. So we'll talk about equine herpes, rhinopneumonitis, equine influenza, strangles, Potomac horse fever. I see here we have some questions. Do you want me to pause and answer these questions? Um, I think uh, Jane is doing a great job oh. in the Q&A, but I do have a few on Facebook. Okay. Um, uh, and they're about actually uh, the process of vaccinations. Uh, uh, one of our followers uh, is asking if there can ever be swelling after a vaccination. And then the other, uh, uh, Joan, uh, says that her horse uh, is reactive to vaccines, uh, breaks out in hives, uh, bets, and she gives uh, the horse some banamine both before and after she treat, uh, she vaccinates the horse. Uh, but she's also uh, decided not to vaccinate against West Nile because she feels that that uh, is causing her to be more reactive. Um, and she's asking about titers. Do horses really need to be vaccinated every year? Okay. So the first question regarding can you see swelling at um, a site where you gave a vaccine? And the answer is absolutely. Um, we see swelling um, and that's one reason why we like to not use those gluteal muscles because gravity doesn't help us there. So um, using something like the pectoral muscles or those semi-membranosis, semi-tendinosis or the hamstrings of the animal, those are two places where if they do develop a swelling, you can, um, it's gravity dependent, um, doesn't really impede the horse in any way. Um, when you do use the neck muscle and you develop swelling, one concern is that the horse will be um, reluctant to eat because it has a stiff or sore neck. And so um, we do see that. Um, when I was in private practice, I would say, oh man, um, almost if I was vaccinating a, you know, a barn of 50 to 80 horses, there was always one horse, one or two horses that would, I would get a call about either that night or the next day that they were stiff, um, maybe had a low grade fever or something like that. So um, it's definitely a common um, thing that we see. And then the next question was about um, if we can use um, titers to um, monitor your horse's immune um, response to vaccines and the risk factors. And so um, one thing I, in my experience, and maybe Dr. Manfredi would want to chime in too, but 
Um, we, I understand the tighter, um, and there is current research going on, to my knowledge, to try and get a better handle on what an appropriate horse tighter is. And that is the, the limitation, um, is that um, unfortunately it seems to be easier just to administer the vaccine versus trying to figure out what a normal horse tire is. And, and so that is probably all that I can comment on that. Um, I have had horses that develop hives, um, have trouble breathing, and things that we have done is, number one, trying to either change the brand of vaccine. So if you are using um, Marielle products, maybe you switch to Zoetis products, um, breaking up those vaccines. So you typically will give a horse um, potentially all of those core vaccines in one shot. And it may be something where you need to break them up and not give them all in one. Um, so there's a couple of different strategies. Um, but does that help answer your question? I can comment. I can com I can comment a little bit on the tighter. So the one um, vaccine that I've actually run the most titers for is for strangles. Um, so this is the, the respiratory bacteria that you can see um, in the pictures here have kind of abscesses, white kind of um, purulent material coming from the nose and underneath the jaw. And so we do know with strangles that if the horse has an exceptionally high titer, if you re-give the strangles vaccine, a certain percentage of those horses, a small number, can have a reaction to that. So the strangles is the one where I actually have titered horses to see what the level is um, to decide if you need to give the vaccine that year or if you can skip it for the next year. But you do need to have that number um, to be able kind of to assess if you can um, bypass it for that year alone. Um, the other thing that's currently been talked about a little bit was um, titers to the rabies vaccine. And so in horses, um, we have seen that horses do have some degree of a titer for a number of years after the rabies vaccine is given. But the big question is, how much is enough? So rabies is, again, a disease that can pass to humans. Um, and so to be able to see <laughs> what the appropriate amount of uh, titer would be so that the horse doesn't die and or be able to pass it on to humans is something that is um, a little bit too risky to kind of undertake or not ethical to undertake in, um, in a scientific process. So even though we do see they have an immune response, because it is such a lethal disease, um, most of us are uncomfortable with saying we can you know, wait a year or two years before we give the next dose. And so right now where it stands is we do know that they do have a, a response, but for safety and to keep you safe as much as your horse, um, right now the current recommendation is we still are doing that on a yearly basis, if that makes sense. Thank you both. Okay, well, let's move on and we'll go to the risk-based vaccines and just um, feel free to interrupt me at any point if you have more questions. So when we talk about rhinopneumonitis, this is the herpes virus. So we talk about equine herpes virus 1 and equine herpes virus 4. Um, both can cause respiratory disease in our animals. Um, the one that we are more concerned about as a veterinarian um, for your horse is if your horse were to contract EHV-1. Um, number one, this is associated with abortion storms. So if your mare is pregnant, um, we will specifically vaccinate her through her pregnancy to try and prevent an abortion. It's associated with neonatal death. And um, most importantly, it can transform into something called the equine herpes myeloencephalitis, which means it goes from respiratory to neurologic, and these animals get progressively ill very quickly. Um, and so I think it was in 2007, maybe even earlier, 2015, we had an outbreak of um, EHV-1, and they were um, becoming neurologic, which was a very scary thing. Um, here in Michigan. So in 2018, we saw one horse reported for the neurologic form of herpes. 
And in 2019, I could not find one horse. So that's a very good thing. So we did not have any reported cases of the neurologic form of herpes last year. And we do not have any as of this year either. So horses that are traveling or under stress should be vaccinated. So these are horses going to shows, uh, maybe going on trail rides where they're in contact with other horses, horses that are at boarding facilities. Um, this is a short-lived immunity vaccine. So we typically will vaccinate horses every six months. As I commented on the last slide, we also vaccinate pregnant mares. And so this is a specific vaccine. Um, it's a killed vaccine. Um, at five, seven, and nine months of gestation to try and prevent this mare from having, um, becoming infected and aborting. Um, this picture I have in here is just to remind everyone if your horse was to abort, um, everything in this picture is potentially infectious. So the fluid, the placenta, and that fetus, everything in it is um, could potentially contagious. So you wanna be very careful with what you do with that. Equine influenza, very common, um, highly contagious aerosolized, so respiratory disease. Um, clinical signs are dry cough, nasal discharge, fever, depression, decreased appetite. Rarely fatal, um, but horses can be out of performance for up to six months if they do contract influenza. Um, this um, virus also likes to um, bypass the immune system. And so um, when we vaccinate, we wanna make sure that we select a vaccine that's up to date on the current strains that we have in our environment. And we typically will vaccinate these horses every six months. And so um, you'll commonly have your um, vet out and you'll give them a rhino flu vaccine. So that will include your herpes and your influenza. This vaccine you can also give um, intranasally as well, um, as well as having an IM vaccine. Some people believe that that intranasal, there's been some research to show that you'll get a greater immune response with it. Um, so any horse exposed to other horses regularly should be vaccinated. Uh, as Dr. Manfredi just talked about a little bit a second ago, strangles, it's a highly contagious disease. It's now here in Michigan, as of 2018, it is a reportable disease here in Michigan. The actual bacteria is called Streptococcus equi, subspecies equi. Um, common disease that we see in our young horses. Um, there's always a question in um, whether or not you should vaccinate for this is, um, Dr. Manfredi just made the comment about if you already, if your horse has already been exposed to it and has an appropriate titer, vaccinating it can actually um, lead to secondary complications like listed on this slide, um, where the horse can actually get what's called bastard strangles, where the, they get develop abscesses throughout their body, um, chondroids, that's what the lower right image is, and that's of the horse's guttural pouch. And what happens is the bacteria, the pus, conglomerate into little pebbles to stone. Some of them get rather large of pus. And so they will sit in the guttural pouches and um, can impede the horses from swallowing. The horses can kind of look like they have chipmunk cheeks. Um, and so that's something that we have to use endoscopy to try and diagnose. These horses, if they do have chondroids, are chronic shedders as well. So we definitely want to treat these animals if you do find one in your herd. You can also get purpura hemorrhagica, which is a vascular, vascular disease. Um, horses can get pretty sick from that as well. The most common clinical signs that we'll see is a fever. Um, they may have trouble swallowing, not wanting to eat. Um, and we'll see these swellings and abscesses of the lymph nodes, typically under the mandible. And we'll also see some mucopurulent nasal discharge. So in 2020, so in this year, um, we've had eight confirmed cases so far. Um, just briefly to talk, because um, we're here in Michigan, we do have a vaccine for Potomac horse fever. Um, so this is a disease that causes um, GI signs, and so um, horses can develop 
enterocolitis, which is diarrhea. Um, they will be anorexic, lethargic, uh, not wanting to eat, maybe colicky. Um, and so we see this is transmitted by the freshwater insects that carry the bacteria. And so this is not a mosquito vector disease. So mosquitoes do not give this to our horses. Um, it is the water insects like the damselflies, the mayflies, um, that your horse can contract this if they consume that animal. So if they're out grazing on pasture and there's a dead insect that they eat, or if they're drinking water and there's a dead insect that has the bacteria that they consume, that is one the way how they get this um, Potomac horse fever. So there is a vaccine, like I said, um, the efficacy is questionable because there are so many strains of this um, disease. Um, so whether or not you decide to vaccinate for it will be something to discuss with your veterinarian and the risks that you have in your area. Um, briefly to talk about um, recommended vaccination guidelines. So for our foals, we tend to start vaccinating at four to six months of age. Like we discussed earlier, your foal will initially have immunity from the colostrum consumed from the mare's milk, okay? And so um, we'll start, once that foal is weaned is when we typically will start vaccinating. And so they'll get a two series, um, but with a, so they'll get initial injection and then four to six weeks later, they'll get a booster. And then that final booster is at about a year of age. And you tend to want to vaccinate these guys before our mosquito season. So this time of the year is the ideal time of the year to start um, vaccinating um, for these boosters. For pregnant mares, like I mentioned before, four to six weeks prior to foaling, um, if you purchase a mare or you do not know that pregnant mares vaccine history, it is recommended by AAP to give them a two dose primary series. So you'd give her a vaccine uh, like 12 weeks before her due date and then again at four to six weeks um, prior. So um, adult horses are boosted yearly before that mosquito season. Um, one thing I think it's um, important to think about, um, you know, a lot of people do vaccinate their own horses and that is fine. Um, one reason why um, it is recommended to have veterinarians administer um, vaccines is because um, of knowing how they, that, in, that vaccine has been handled. Um, and so making sure it's not been exposed to any sunlight, freezing or high temperatures, making sure that you're administering it in the proper location via the correct route. And what I mean by that is that you don't take an intranasal vaccine and give it in the muscle. You can get terrible reactions for doing that um, with your horse. And so another reason why um, drug companies will back veterinarians who administer the vaccine and that horse then potentially contracts the, the disease. And so, for example, Zoetis is one of the drug companies, one of the main ones that makes um, equine vaccines. They will reimburse up to $5,000 in diagnostics and treatments if your horse was vaccinated by a licensed veterinarian. And so that is one reason why to consider having um, your regular vet out to administer these vaccines. Um, I didn't mention this earlier, but there's no such thing as a 100% efficacious vaccine as well. So um, even though you vaccinate, doesn't mean your horse couldn't contract the disease. Uh, so in summary, biosecurity is a concern among horse owners and veterinarians. Um, routine vaccines along with appropriate management practices are two major components of biosecurity. Um, and we certainly recommend consulting your regular veterinarian to come up with that appropriate biosecurity plan for your farm. These are just a couple of references. Then I guess we've got some time for some questions. Um, Julie and Jane, uh, we do have uh, just uh, one more uh, comment from Joan off of Facebook. Um, she wants to thank you uh, for answering her earlier questions. Uh, but she also wants to ask if you have experienced uh, horses reacting uh, 
any more severely to uh, the West Nile vaccine uh, as compared to other vaccines. Um, I, I can give you a little, and if Jane, if you have anything to add to, please speak up. Um, my understanding is that when the West Nile vaccine initially came out, we did have an increased number of horses having reactions. Um, so this vaccine, um, when West Nile um, was a huge concern and we were, um, did not have any immunity to it, um, they, the vaccine was pushed through rather quickly. And so there were more horses having a reaction to it. My impression clinically now, um, it is not a vaccine that I see there being any increased number of horses having reactions if you have West Nile in that vaccine. Um, for me, I think um, probably the one that I see more than not that I see reactions to is actually the rhino um, influenza, I think is what I've seen more so, but it's really horse dependent and it depends on the company um, and what vaccine you're using as well. And I just wanna say that um, for the most part, you know, any vaccine reactions that they get for the most part are, are normally typically pretty mild, luckily. So mm -hmm. a little bit of a fever or soreness, that's a majority of the horses, if they have anything, it is um, something of that level. Um, so that's the good news. And I would agree with Julie that when the West Nile vaccine first came out, there was maybe a little bit more problems with it. But you know, for right now, um, I guess that's not one of the ones I typically worry about. I guess the rhino and the rabies would be more of a chance for a reaction in, in my hands anecdotally. But on the whole, if we're looking at the large population and vaccine reactions in horses, these vaccines are pretty darn safe. Um, to give um, or have just normally very minimal side effects. So um, that could be mitigated by banamine or bute beforehand. Excellent, thank you. Um, another question from our Facebook audience from Sue. Um, I have two feral bustings who have never been vaccinated. I have them gentled and I need their vaccinations done. One is almost three and one is a yearling. Should they also be boosted after their initial vaccinations? Yes, yes. So they'll need a vaccine and then four to six weeks later, a second booster. Um, and then that will be an annual vaccine from there on out. So you, um, you, they definitely will, you would assume them to not have any um, prior exposure at this point um, to a vaccine. And we have uh, one uh, question in our Q&A from Zoom, and this is from Colette. Uh, horses survived for thousands of years in the wild, so how do wild horses survive viruses if domestic horses need all of these vaccines? So I can start answering that and Julie can talk to it too, but um, so sometimes they don't. Um, and then sometimes some of these wild horses actually do, depending on where the population is, get some of these basic vaccines administered to them too. Um, you know, as well, I'm thinking about some of the ponies on the island and other places. So um, the other thing that helps is that a lot of the domestic horses, which make up a large amount of the population, do um, have vaccinations here, so it's less likely for mosquitoes to be biting horses and spreading it between them, since a lot of our domestic horses do have antibodies um, for this as well. So the answer is that yes, some of them likely do die, um, and then a lot of them are protected because of the vaccines that are being given to the other um, bits of the population. Um, and yeah, I don't know, Julie, if you have other things to add to that as well. No, I. I I agree with you. I don't. That's a good question, though. It's... I was. I, I have a question, actually, to the both of y'all. Um, <laughs> I we've talked a lot about uh, 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 timing of uh, vaccinations. Uh, is there um, 
any concern with waiting until it gets really, really hot in the summer uh, to vaccinate a horse if you're concerned with uh, them being more reactive? Is it better to vaccinate maybe earlier in the season when it's still a little cooler? Or is there uh, no difference? I can start to tackle that one. So um, for me, the most critical thing is um, to try and get them vaccinated before the mosquito season. So before the vector season. And um, as far as temperature goes, um, I think if a horse is going to react and develop a fever, it's going to develop that fever regardless of what time of year it is. And so I'm not necessarily worried like um, let's say we were here in Michigan going to have a 90 degree day next week. Um, I wouldn't necessarily change, you know, not vaccinating a set of animals. Um, you certainly always want to make sure that the horse is free of disease at the time of vaccinations, make sure that they're eating, drinking, acting normal prior to um, get, taking a temperature before you vaccinate them is always an important thing. Um, a general physical exam before you're going to administer any vaccine. But I don't really worry about the temperature as much as I worry about getting that within the vector season and um, making sure I have those vaccines on board before the mosquitoes come. The All only right. other thing I wanted to add about, about timing, um, just to add one last point, is that so sometimes people will um, split the vaccines up for um, example, sometimes we want to give the intranasals at a different time than mm -hmm. when we're giving the, the muscle vaccine so we don't have any contamination. Um, but if you are going to split up the vaccines, they should at least be given two weeks apart um, because we do have some data that shows if you're giving them only a week apart that they can actually um, block the body's response, um, immune response you have to those vaccines. So if you are going to split them up, um, like try to give at least two weeks between the two groups. Great, thank you both uh, very much. It looks like that has cleared our Q&A on both uh, Facebook and uh, Zoom. Um, so with that, at, it is one o'clock. I want to thank uh, uh, Dr. Manfredi and uh, Dr. Stracota. Uh, for joining us today and giving an excellent presentation. I also want to uh, throw out the suggestion here. Uh, you know, this uh, pandemic has really um, hurt a lot of us uh, financially. Um, and some of the hardships, uh, you may start uh, evaluating, you know, what you need to spend your money on. Um, there are some avenues to get support for your horse if you are in a uh, financial hardship right now due to the uh, virus. So I would urge you to check with uh, the American Horse Council and the American Equine Practitioner Association. Uh, they both are supporting uh, some um, funding for uh, uh, horses uh, with some needs during this time. Um, so those may be able to help you out. I will also cross post uh, some of those uh, avenues on our My Horse University Facebook page. Uh, Jane, Julie, anything to add? No, thanks for having us. No, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you guys. All right, take care everybody.